This past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, the first day of Lent. Lent is a season of inviting the Holy Spirit to examine us and reveal those idols that have grabbed control of my life. This is something we shouldn't do only during Lent. We should be doing it all the time. But Lent is a period of the year to be reminded of the importance of confessing our idols. Because if our lives have turned toward idols, our thinking and our actions are affected, and we cannot please God when we're headed in that direction. I want us all to take a moment to consider what is it that drives my thinking, my attitudes, and my actions? Am I driven by God's Word? Is my heart turned towards Christ? Do my actions reveal that I trust in God? Or am I controlled by fears? Fear can be an idol. Do my actions and attitudes show love for my neighbor? James, 1 John, and Paul's letters all stress that if our hearts are turned toward God, it will show in valuing others as more important than myself. When I consider an action in my life, is my first thought to consider what Jesus would do, or are there other voices that I hear first? And then the question at the root of all of these other questions is this, what does this reveal about my heart? And if my heart is turned towards Christ, or if my heart is turned toward anything else? Is my heart facing God, or is my heart turned towards something else? I want you to take just a moment to think about, prayerfully think about that question. What is God saying about your heart and who or what it is facing? What needs to decrease in your life so Jesus Christ can increase? You know, 20 seconds in the middle of a sermon is not really enough time to consider this. So I would encourage you to set aside one meal this week for prayer and fasting. One meal that you skip and use that time to ask God, what must decrease in my life so that you can increase? Not eating for a period of time, what we call fasting, is effective because it sets aside our physical nourishment to focus on the spiritual food that we need. It increases our hunger for God and weakens the grip that our bodies have over our spirit. Fasting intensifies our yearning for God because when you skip that meal and your brain and your stomach are telling you it's time to eat, it's just one small way to deny yourself And say, God, I need you more than I need that food. Now, if it would be medically harmful for you to skip a meal, then don't do that. But if it's just inconvenient for you, I encourage you to try it. Deny yourself so you can give yourself more fully to the Lord. And don't just work through your lunch and call that a fast. Set aside 15 minutes to pray over the question, what must decrease so Jesus can increase. Ask the Holy Spirit to lead your thoughts. Write down scriptures that come to mind. Write down one or two things that need to decrease. Write down one or two things the Spirit is leading you to do instead. Set aside one meal and 15 minutes to devote to the Lord and trust that God will anoint that time that you set aside. If it seems that that time has been empty and dull, know that if you've done it in an attitude of submission to God's purposes, it will not be time that is wasted. You just might not see the fruit of that time until later. Now, Adam and Eve had their hearts turned toward the wrong things, to lies instead of God's truth, to idols instead of God's love and God's reign. And because they were on the wrong path, they crashed, and they crashed spectacularly. Their hearts turned towards darkened thinking and disobedient actions, and their sin led to curses and punishment and shame and hiding and isolation. And this is a critical point in the story and everything that will come after this story in the Bible, because now that the humans have failed, what is God going to do about it? How will God respond to their sin? What precedent will God set for dealing with human sin? 
For the answer to that question, we go later in Genesis 3 to verse 21, and it says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed clothed them. That seems pretty simple. But did God owe that to Adam and Eve? You sinned, now I'm going to make clothing for you to cover yourselves up. Did they deserve for God to cover up their sin and their shame? I think that's really what their de- this detail is about. It's not about clothing their physical bodies. They were ashamed and they were trying to hide. The humans have been changed by their sin and now they're feeling the effects of that guilt and shame and they want to hide themselves and so God provides them with a way to hide while they can still be in relationship with Him and with each other. It's not ideal, but God is committed to finding a way forward. God does not give up on Adam and Eve just because they have fallen. In verse 22, God says, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and must not be allowed to take from the tree of life and live forever. Now this is judgment, that humans cannot live forever and they will experience suffering and death because of sin. But at the same time, it is grace because God does not force us to live in sin for eternity. Can you imagine if we had to suffer the pain of our bodies decaying as we get older, changing because of the sin that has come into the world, and we had to experience this suffering in the world because of sin, and we had to live forever in that state without hope for anything different? Can you imagine? Death is a judgment against sin, but it is also grace and hope that there is something better on the other side of death. Life on a sinful earth will not continue without an end. Life in a failing body will not continue without an end. Death is judgment, but it is also mercy and hope that God has prepared something better for those who believe in Jesus Christ, for those who put their trust in Jesus Christ. In verse 23, we read, So the Lord God banished Adam from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. And after God drove Adam out, he placed on the east side of the garden angels and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Again, this is clearly judgment and a consequence for sin, but the angels and the flaming sword also guarantee that we do not go back to eat from that tree that would let us live forever in a state of sin. Adam and Eve turned their hearts from God and walked into the den of sin, but God did not give up on them. Instead of just looking at their sin, God sees that they are made in his image, that at their core they are good. There's judgment against their sin, and there are real and distressing results because of sin, but God not only allows, but God provides. God ensures that there is a way for Adam and Eve away from the sin that they have fallen into. God guarantees that they are not doomed to live in their sin forever. And God clothes them to relieve them of their shame. God forgives them and allows them to live. And God appoints the flaming sword as a safeguard that they will not be contemned, condemned to live on this earth forever. Because what Adam and Eve did not know is that God had already made a plan to deal with the sin of the world. God already knew that he was going to call Abram to be the father of God's people. God knew that the people would go to Egypt to find food and they would stay there and end up in slavery. God had already laid out their deliverance from Egypt. God had laid out 40 years that they would live in the desert where they would learn to trust God. God knew that they would reject him as their king, that they would spend a thousand years looking for another king who would come and save them. And God knew that when the time in history was just right, He would send His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, born of a woman, to die on the cross to save His people and the whole human race. 1 Peter 1.20 says, Jesus was chosen before the creation of the world. Chosen before creation, but was revealed in these times for your sake. Jesus was chosen for his mission before the creation of the world. Now the next statement that I'm going to make, just a quick statement, 
Not in the Bible, it's just an I wonder question. But I wonder if God consulted with Jesus before creating the world. I wonder if God laid out to Jesus, this is what's going to happen. They're going to sin, they're going to turn away from me, and we have to have an answer. So if we're going to do this, I need you to be willing to go when the time is right to save these people from their sin. Will you do it? I don't know, but I wonder if God put that question to Jesus. Are you willing before creation ever came into being? Adam and Eve sinned and brought these consequences of sin into the world, but each one of us has sinned against God, and we have to come to terms with that. That our hearts turn away from God. That our minds become darkened. That our actions become disobedient. And that little old sin of ours, what does that little old sin really hurt? What was the consequences of Adam and Eve's one little old sin? It literally changed the whole universe. If you think your sin is no big deal, you need to look again. Sin is a huge deal because it impacts all of creation. It impacts how we treat people and it separates us from God. We are guilty. And if we realize the gravity of our sin and the holiness of God, we will be ashamed and we will want to hide from God as well. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they did not do one thing to earn their way back to God. God did it all. God made them clothing out of the animal skin. God banished them from the garden as punishment, but also as grace, so they wouldn't live forever. God placed the, gar- the sword in front of the garden as judgment, but as grace, so they wouldn't eat from the tree of life. And in Genesis 4, God is still in relationship with them. God is still pursuing them. God is still speaking to them and guiding them. They did nothing to deserve it. It was God's grace that drew Adam and Eve to him and forgave their sins. In the same way, God sent Jesus Christ to do this for us. Not because we deserved any part of it, not because we did anything to earn it back, but because God loved us enough that he sent Christ to cover our sins, to remain in relationship even after we had sinned. And to say, I want you back, even if you try to hide from me. Now, I hope you take the time to fast and pray this week. One meal, 15 minutes, to ask, Holy Spirit, what needs to decrease in me so that Christ can increase? And when you find out what that sin is, what that idol is that has turned you away from God, I want you to do four things. Number one is confess your idol. God already knows. So just agree with God that your heart has turned away from him and is pursuing this other thing. Number two is repent. The word repent means to turn around or return. So ask God, you know your heart has turned to something else, ask him to help you repent and to turn your heart back to him. Only God can change our heart. So we ask the Spirit to help us control our mind and our actions and to express our desire to know God and serve Him more. Once you have confessed and repented, number three is think about Jesus. Use a verse that helps you think about Jesus. Look at a picture that helps you think about Jesus. Listen to music about Jesus. Think about His eternal nature. Think about His birth. Think about His life and His teaching. Think about His death on the cross where He took the burden from our sin and made a sacrifice for our sin. Think about His resurrection, the promise of new life for all that trust in Him. Do something to think about Jesus. Think about Jesus in Revelation 3.20 where He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears My voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with Me. He's not knocking on the doors of 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 saints and perfect people. He's knocking on the doors of sinners. Jesus is standing at the door, knocking today, asking if we will let him take our sin and our shame and replace it with his new life. And it comes back to the question, do you trust him? 
Do you trust Christ? Do you trust His way? Do you trust Him enough to come back to Him? Or do you still think there's a better way? Do you still think that you can do it yourself? Do you still refuse to let go of your idol? Jesus has made a way for you back to God. Put your trust in Him today, whether it's for the first time or the millionth time. Do not hide, but receive His forgiveness today. His blood was shed. His life was restored for this reason, to save us from our sin. Jesus is knocking. Will you open the door for Him today? Lord Jesus, we, we know, we confess that all of us have sinned and fallen short of what you have called us to. All of us fall short of your glory. All of us fall short of obeying the law that you have put in the Bible. All of us fall short, and it stops at that. And on our own, left to our own devices and left in our own sin, we would be helpless and weak. But Lord Jesus, you, by your love and your grace and mercy, have provided the way for us out of our sin and back to God, our loving Father. And Jesus, we are so thankful. By the blood that you shed on the cross, you covered our sin. And when you rose from the dead, you showed us that there is new life in you. When you ascended to heaven, you showed us that there is eternal life for all of us who trust in you. Lord, we pray this week that you would help us to look very honestly at our hearts, at our lives, at our idols, so that we can recognize them, so that we can turn them over to you. Lord, we pray that these things in our life would decrease so that you can increase. Lord, we are so thankful for every promise you have laid out before us. And we pray that you would help us to do what we can do to turn towards you, to be fertile ground for you, to, to plant your seeds in us. But Lord, we, all, we, we ultimately recognize that it is your power, it is your spirit, it is your love and salvation that gives us hope, that can change us and transform us, that can make us into the creations that you want us to be. Lord, we rely on you in all these things. Help us to turn to you, to be obedient in all that you call us to. Jesus, we pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. I'd invite you to stand as we sing our closing song in response to God's heart for us. to age he stands 
Amen. God is great because of God's character, but we recognize that one of the, the most important ways we see that is in God's compassion to us that he's shown us in, through his son, Jesus Christ. As we go today, the human heart easily turns away from God and trusts in other things, but thanks be to God. He has shown us the way back to him. It is through his son, Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose again so that we might be saved. May we return to God and live for Jesus with every breath that he has given to us. And before I release you, I'm going to make one small request. I haven't seen you people in three weeks. Would you let me walk down the aisle and out the back and into the, the outside area there so that I can say hi to you as you come past today? Would you let me do that? All right, amen, and go in peace.